What is intelligence? Well, I like to define here the intelligence. It's kind of an ability to process information, to make, make informed future decisions. And the field of the AI, which is the very high these days, it's, um, it's to build the artificial algorithms to do exactly that. Now, machine learning is, again, it's a subset of the AI, which focuses on teaching an algorithm, how to take that information, and do this without being explicitly being told about the sequence of the rules, but instead learn the sequence of the patterns of the data from the sequence itself. And the deep learning itself, it's a subset of the machine learning, which takes this idea one step further and tries to extract the patterns automatically from the raw data, which is being fed without any human intervention and annotate these rules, which the system needs to learn. One very basic example is um, it's an image uh, classification problem, which is a very typical statement that you can't read the image in the model or in the computer itself. So image is being pixelated. And after doing the image classification, the model will itself give you some confidence score. And that confidence score is nothing but it just it determines whether it's uh, which particular category of the uh, subject or the entity it belongs to. So here you can see that the cat image, after doing the image classification, it says that 82% of the cat and 15% symbolizes to the dog and the rest others. So let's start with one of the basic building block of the machine learning or the NLP kind of algorithms. Um, so here we have the supervised and unsupervised learning. And in the supervised learning, we have the input data, which is like labeled data. In unsupervised, the data is itself not labeled. And the goal in the supervised learning is you need to determine the mapping function, which uh, from the input variable to the output variable itself. And while in the unsupervised, uh, the goal is to learn underlying structure, what's the distribution of the data it, it looks like and how we can understand uh, what the data itself is telling. So a lot of ED and all these processes takes place. Superpli supervised learning, um, it's categorized into further uh, branches, the classification problems or the regression. Linear regression is one such um, algorithm for the regression problems and the decision trees are for the classification. Classification is nothing but certain classes to which the data should symbolize. And the decision trees are, you know, like one kind of um, making some kind of nodes and then you just prune whatever the nodes applies. Um, while in the unsupervised, you get the clustering problems. It, you can use uh, key means and all these algorithms or it could be like rule-based, so a priori and EM algorithms. I'll just give an example on um, one of the supervised learning algorithm, which is again, the linear regression. Yes. Uh, can you see the screen on this? Yep. Yes, we can. Thank you so much. So here I have this sales data set and the data set itself comprises of the land, the square feet and the cross square feet and certain other features or the columns of the data set that you have. The goal is to determine if given the dimensions of the land, what will be the price or the, you know, like how much you need to spend in order to buy that particular land. That's how the business goal or the end goal is defined. So you need to determine what's the exact figure or the value itself. So again, it's a regression problem. And um, I used already existing libraries in the Ruby and if I run, Here the model itself is learning and doing some multiple iterations and epochs, and then it is going to determine for the specific dimension that I need to pay this much of, uh, you know, like I need to spend this much dollars. And I can share also the code. Code is like pretty simple. Um, Here again, I am just reading the data set itself. And in that data set, I have some X and Y variables, whatever the target is. And then again, I'm using this regression, linear regression model. And then I'm feeding, uh, you know, like using the gradient descent, which is again, one such particular type of algorithm. And I'm just testing on a particular dimension because I want to see whatever the model has learned. Now I need to test on it. 
and by testing, I mean by if I'm feeding this particular test dimensions, what could be the output or the you know like output it will predict. So that's the predicted price, and that's what we can see it over here. So that's one particular category of uh, linear regression. Uh, so that's one example of the supervised uh, learning that is the linear regression. Yes. Um, one such example you can ask is what if we have the data which has huge dimensions or there are so many uh, you know like redundant features which are not helpful in predicting whatever the output that we want. So we come over here like the dimensionality reduction algorithms to the rescue. What I want, uh, meant by is so there are like the data that we saw in the previous examples of sales data set. So you have like specific columns or just a smaller features. What if the features are huge? And what if some of the features are highly correlated? Or what if some features which are redundant, which are not helpful in predicting whatever the uh, output is? So we can use some of the dimensionality reduction algorithms and PC is one such example. Using the PCA basically, it helps in finding the covariance of the features and therefore we can remove and chunk it out. I just want to give one more example on the, uh, the entire theme behind this uh, talk as, you know, like the determination of the conversational styles of an individual, especially people those are in the New York versus in the West or on the East Coast. So um, when I meant by how will I determine the conversational styles of the individuals, um, and also the data set which is being given to me is a switchboard data set. So in the switchboard data set, you will be, you will be having the audio samples. And from the audio uh, or the wave files, you will need to determine the conversational styles. And what I meant by the conversational styles is, um, I mean, it could be like based on the cultural or it could be based on some of the features that we have never thought about. For example, there is one famous book by the uh, Deborah Tannen that, uh, which says that it's not what you say, it's the way that you say it. And Debra Tannen is one of the uh, very highly renowned and linguistic and social linguistic and a professor, um, which gives an overview how the cultural differences affects the way that the people talk and listen, and also coins the term slow and polite. Slow and polite determines high considerateness, and the fast and aggressiveness determines high involvement. So when you start and stop talking, how fast you talk, how you use the pitch, loudness, tone of the voice, rhythm, what's the point, what's likely to be, and how you, do you get to it? And how do you talk about when and whom? If the people notice all these aspects of the features or the speech features, they don't attribute them to the language habits, but to the speaker's ability or the personality. For example, that's what you meant by the thinking of the New Yorkers, they are generally like loud and pushing. Here, I am determining uh, the problem statement, which is a determination of the conversational style. So whenever you are pro uh, defining any problem statement in machine learning on the deep learning, you need to determine what's the features, how will you extract the features, what all existing algorithms are there, and what could be the predicted output will be. And you need to do some EDA, which is exploratory data analysis, and understand the hypothesis that you have presented, how it is, uh, you know, like either it is, um, towards that hypothesis or either it's deviation from the hypothesis. And that's kind of a novel algorithm that we devised. Um, so here, there are multiple features that I, uh, I mean, thought about in order to determine the conversational styles. One is the speech rate, which is um, the average number of words per second in an utterance. Utterance is nothing but the, uh, the wave files or the audio samples that you have been given. And the utterance implies that you have been given for a speaker, there is a start time, there is an end time. Repetition is the count of the non-stop quotes. If the people are not aware in this uh, room, what the stop quotes are, basically the stop quotes are nothing but the punctuation or the words which are very frequently being used. For example, all the, uh, you know, like vowels, or it could be punctuation marks. So repetition is like the count of the, those non-stop quotes in each utterance or each sentence you can say. Loudness, it's again, uh, uh, it's non linear function of the amplitude, frequency, and bandwidth. And especially in Ruby, we have all the libraries available in order to determine all these features, in order to extract all these features. 
I'll talk more on the libraries that I've used in order to extract all these features. Because firstly, you need to uh, talk through what all features that I'm going to uh, extract from the data set itself. Again, the page. Ruby has um, some of the libraries which gives uh, the pitch. And the duration is nothing but the start and the end time of every sentence or every utterance. And the utterance is the count of the words in every sentence. And pronoun rate is nothing but the count of the pronouns divided by the total number of words. So that's how the after doing the feature extraction using some of the libraries in the Ruby, that's how the data frame or the data set looks like that you have the file, all these wave files. You have the start and the end time. And each sentence is, uh, you know, like whatever the sentence a person has spoken on in that particular instance. And the speech rate has been calculated. Utterance is definitely there. And the repetition, pronoun, rate, loudness, and pitch. These were all the features that were extracted from this particular sentence. So all these features are nothing but the combination of the acoustic and the linguistic or the paralinguistic features that you can see. Um, excuse me, yes. Rash, Rashmi. Mm -hmm. um, yes. You said you used various Ruby libraries to calculate these different features. Yes, that's correct. Okay, this is whoa, this is crazy. All right, <laughs> I just wanted to confirm that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So I can, uh, there are a um, bunch of libraries, especially like um, for extracting like all these, uh, you know, like, so you can, so this sentence will need to be first tokenized. And then once you have tokenized that sentence, what I meant by tokenized is you parse this entire sentence and each word will be a token in that particular sentence. And uh, yeah, the libraries, which I meant by, there is a tokenizer library NLP Pure is one other library which I used. And Scapel, I think, is a disambiguation tool or there is one other library which I used. And you need to do stemming and then you need to determine. Uh, again, these are all mathematics behind it, like the way that I told about here. You need to calculate, the, for example, for the speech rate, you need to calculate the number of words or the token per second. Here I meant by the per second is, you know, like by division by the uh, start and end time because this entire thing is being given to you. And also there are certain libraries in which you can convert the audio text, like the wave files to the sentence. Sometimes the transcripts are not being given. So there are other libraries like speech to text, speech -to -text conversion libraries as well. And I'll push up all my code on the GitHub and I'll, uh, towards the end, I'll link through that code so that people can also see and you know, like provide me some feedback and whatever the thoughts that they have. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. No worries. Yeah. Um, so once I have, I have extracted all these features, uh, the next logical steps, which goes by, how will I do the exploited data analysis? And what I meant by EDA is, I need to understand what the data itself is saying to me before being implement, before implementing any kind of machine learning or NLP or any algorithm for that sake. Because once you don't have the understanding what the data exactly is telling you or giving what's the summary or the information of the data is, you can't uh, go around haywire and talk about, you know, like, oh, these are the different big, big algorithms or in the black box. Um, and that's more justifiable. You need to understand the data, understand the inclusion behind it, whatever the hypothesis testing that you want to do, and then further uh, feed in the machine learning pipeline that is the uh, algorithms subset. So here again, I use the library, which is Charty, and that's like freely available. And it was like very handy to use. Here, once I use that library, I got this graph. And this graph determines, uh, so here I think uh, I've not exactly plotted the legions, basically uh, what is the Western and the NYC, uh, you know, like states. So these are the different regions and the speech rate is of course, like on the Y axis. Here we can see uh, the basic is, uh, you know, like the, female from the West and they have like the high speech rate as compared to male from the NYC. So there, this is also like on the basis of the gender as well as on the basis of the different regions altogether. The next one is again for the pitch and there is a count of the people. Like again, there is a deviation. For example, the female, they have the lower pitch and the male, you know, like they generally have the higher pitch. 
this is again histogram and uh, plotted using the chart library. Um, okay, and uh, again there are uh, like bunch of other libraries which I was talking to when there is a speech to text or you know like text to speech because initially I was being given all these wave files. I need to read through these audio files and convert that into the sentence. There is a spe uh, text to speech or speech to text uh, DTS is one such. Um, ESP Ruby is also one such, uh, which gives you all these, uh, you know, like conversions and they're like pretty decent. And uh, yeah, there is again, Google API, which converts all these, uh, in mix, uh, gives you the transcripts. Uh, so I was talking, yeah. So this ED again. Question, just a quick question. Mm -hmm. um, is the cardinality of the data other than the token by token? So like the pitch, is that for the entire utterance? Or is that yeah. per word? Yeah, sure. So the utterance is uh, the entire uh, sentence itself. Right. But like, so example, this information, this is about the pitch, right? Yes. Um, so the pitch, is this per like every utterance? Is this every utterance the histogram of the whole thing? So is it a histogram of like, you know, say so you have a thousand utterances and this is like the mapping of all of them? Or is this kind of based on a per, per word? Because I imagine that sometimes how pitch is is I'm asking about the cardinality of how how do you decide to break the data up? Is it could be is it done per word or is it done per utterance? Uh, that's that's kind of what I'm asking. I don't know if that sure, makes sure. sense. Yeah, absolutely, that makes sense. So I I did the uh, so again I broke down in the form of the utterances and it's not done on the basis of the uh, words because again there were like a lot the matrix was huge. It was thirteen thousand um thirteen uh, lakhs or you know like it's 13 to 10 raised to power five uh, into 10 features. So again, it was done on the basis of the per utterance, this speech, uh, this pitch. Thank you. Sure. Um, does anyone have any other questions? So I, I, I see how you've been, you know, you're, you know, using these libraries and these charts to to get some nice visualizations and to analyze the data. I'm kind of curious yeah. what questions you had or what business decisions you might be, you know, looking to make to, to do differently based on what you're learning here. Like, can you just tell us a little bit more of like the goal of why you were uh, playing around with this and you know what you learned and what you did based on what you learned? Yes, sure. Absolutely. Um, the aim behind this project, like it was to falsify the Debra Tannen's uh, theory in which he mentioned that uh, the New Yorkers are generally like they have high considerateness versus, uh, I mean, they have the high involvement versus uh, Californians, they have the high considerateness. So we want to understand whether that, and that was being published in 1981, that theory. And uh, once now, she did all the analysis and there were like a lot of papers which was done and you know, like published and every stuff. But now we want, we have the new data itself and we want to do the analysis. Is that the theory still valid or not? That was the main aim behind this entire research project. And of course, like there were uh, a lot many, uh, you know, like goals behind doing this. Um, I mean, the business goals were uh, understanding how the speech rate or how the pitch varies with respect to the different regions of the different people altogether and um, understanding what's the demographic, I mean, speech rate with the demographic or the pitch with the demographic. And again, the combination of these features with the demographics. So that's why we try to, you know, like exp um, plot some normal distribution for each kind of a population or maybe there are some stereotypes which are still prevalent. So in terms of like, so I see here kind of the, you talked about some of the demographics, you got women and women and pitch, I'm like an audio person that worked in speech recognition for a decade. So I'm definitely speaking my, my language here. Um, now, now that you know some of these things and you're able to analyze like, hey, what is the pitch? Um, you know, who did you send this data to? Like who consumed it? And what was their response to, you know, when they said the data, did, did they just say thank you? Did they, did they do something differently based on the insights that you provided? And it's fine if they didn't, but I'm kind of curious, 
like just to learn a little bit more of the story of where that all this awesome work that you did landed. Um, yeah, sure. I think uh, for this Vishpo data set that was already curated, it was, I mean, it's a linguistic data itself, which has, um, I think, 2,400 uh, telephonic, uh, I mean, all these wave files. And uh, the data was, again, highly skewed. And possibly uh, the work that we did, uh, I mean, I mean, the work that we did, it's on the recent data set versus the one which was uh, done years ago in 1981. And um, I think, um, and also, I'm sorry, I think I'm not understood the second half of your question. Oh, no, so this is, uh, I'm trying to understand. So it sounds like this data had been collected and collated the last time this was done, 1981. So here we are in 2022, mm -hmm. and we we're able to get some updated information. But yes. just, I'm trying to kind of wrap my mind around the story of like, who used this information? You're like, hey, now we've explored this data. We now know what these pitches are. And I'm kind of curious, like how the kind of the business requirements emerged to you and then how you, you know, you built all this stuff and then where it just, where it just landed. Um, so, you know, if you could tell me about, hey, I gave this data to, you know, this person in this department at this company and they said, thank you. And then they made this decision and they, you know, I don't know, maybe they made it more accessible for women. Like I know that, you know, I know that speech data, for example, speech recognition engines for many, many years, they just weren't, there wasn't a lot of data from women, especially women of color. And so the speech recognition systems wouldn't understand them as well. And once that was learned, then they were able to get more representation into the data set. So I'm kind of curious, you know, anything like that. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. I think uh, that's a very brilliant uh, line of thought. Uh, the use case at the point, uh, I mean, I'm working with a professor from University of San Francisco. We haven't thought through the, uh, I mean, what's the business goal or towards like once the paper has been, it's in the process of publishing, contemporary paper, um, how the it will be, you know, like, will be used in the real world scenario or what could be the end goal towards it. Um, but I think uh, towards your question, um, at this point, definitely, I don't have any answer for that because, again, we ha I haven't given enough thought uh, towards what's, you know, like uh, the consumer end of it. And um, I think, but that's a very exciting question. And uh, again, I would really appreciate for giving me a new pointer to think through that direction. Oh, no, that really helps. Like, uh, so, it's, so this was a, this was a paper and yes. you know, so the goal was to submit research and to contribute to the literature and update the literature. That that completely answers my question. Yeah, I mean, it's already uh, accepted at ACL, and I'll be presenting in the web um, September this year. Yeah, but still, a lot of things we are doing on this on the top of this paper. No, that's wonderful. Congratulations, and it's it's great to see how you use the technology to generate this data. Sure. Thank you so much. Anyone has any other questions? I would love to hear the thoughts. One more, if, if you have a moment. Um, I, I apologize if I missed this. I had to run away to deal with a crying child like maybe 10 minutes ago. Um, but you had mentioned just now that you're you're going, you're running your, your tests over a new data set that's been generated the past couple of years. And this is in um, a, a kind of a new new study in contrast to a test has been run in, in the 1980s, late 1980s. So I was wondering yeah. if you if you had access to the previous data and have run that data through the same uh, test that you're running on the new data and have found any kinds of changes in the demographics over the years. It's not just, you know, things change over time as well as between different demographics. So I was wondering if maybe you were able to see any changes within the demographics themselves. Yes, I have definitely. Uh, I'm sorry I'm not included in the slides itself, but there are like huge bunch of, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, the new uh, results which have been presented. And that's why the comparison was done on the previous data versus the new data. And falsification of the Deborah Tannen's theory was uh, definitely done through it. Um, one such example that I can give on, uh, but that's not included in the slides, is uh, I plotted like the heat maps. And again, it was done in the Ruby because uh, there are so many libraries. Um, was that the education is also like one such premier factor and um, education is one such, the region is definitely one other parameter. 
and there is huge correlation between the speech rate and the pronoun rate so initially the people used uh, i mean the theory which came out like new yorkers used to use uh, a lot of pronouns back in 1980s versus the data that i have in the recent past uh, on the recent years they are uh, on a similar tangent uh, to the people living in the california so now the distribution is uh, you know like it's almost so both the histograms are overlapping um and that's with regards to the pronoun rate for both the uh, yeah i mean pronoun rate with both the regions and over the last couple of years versus uh, in 1980s um that's one such um, i would say i'm curious how was the tooling to use like you know I, I know you showed a little bit of code but if you have any more of the code that you used in the libraries like how did you mm -hmm. find the documentation did you find that you were having to read the source code very much and what were your learnings about specifically using the libraries, which were easy and hard? Uh, and you know, what advice would you have for us following a similar journey? Um, sure. So I think a lot of um, I'll show the uh, code towards the you know, like I'll upload that on the meter group as well. Um, what I'm trying to say is. Um, like, of course, the libraries are in hand, uh, but especially when I have to tweak some parameters, like, uh, for example, um, like, if I do that in Python versus in Ruby, then Python already has a lot many, uh, you know, like libraries and it's well developed in terms of the NLP and machine learning stuff. While in Ruby, some of the libraries were not available and therefore I had to build some Python bindings or, you know, like gems um, bundle and all of that stuff. Uh, for example, uh, there was uh, when I have to do the PCA, there are existing algorithms which do the PCA, but when I have to do the PCA by plot, then the, there are no such libraries which helps in uh, doing the by plot of the PCA. So um, again, it's, uh, it's not about there are not enough resources, but I felt like there is a lot of understanding of the mathematics behind developing all these algorithms which helps in, um, you know, like, coding in, in that particular language. So having understood the mathematics behind it, then I'm, I feel like it's much more easier. But again, there are no such libraries which helps in, uh, for example, the PCI by plot, which I'm saying, or uh, there is, um, you know, like, especially like in the graphs, if I have to do the um, swarm plot, then there are no such, I, I mean, to my limited knowledge in the Ruby, I'm not able to find those, uh, some of those very common plots, which are available in Python versus in Ruby. and um, yeah, that's, that's, I think, uh, I could say in, in, yeah, in my small uh, experience with regards to the uh, Ruby itself. So I started, to be very honest, I started learning Ruby last year when I gave a talk at Ruby conference 2021. Um, so it's pretty fresh in my head and I'm not like, a, a, I mean, I'm not rich and well experienced like others over here on this in this room but i'm fortunate that i got this opportunity and that, uh, yeah i'm honored to share what my learnings are um in this language and of course the project itself does that answer the question i mean it, it does specifically uh you know if you were to uh start this work over knowing what you know now uh what tooling would you choose would you choose ruby python or something else would you choose the libraries that you chose or something else? Um, definitely. I mean, I feel like if there are already libraries which are available in hand, then there is no point in reinventing the wheel. And of course, uh, for example, some of the uh, you know extraction of the features when there are no such frameworks available, for example, like in the NumPy, you just feed in, or maybe like in the Parnas, you just feed in, you know, like, and then get the info or summary of the data itself then in the ruby you have to actually think through how you need to calculate out uh, you know like at least like summary or the distribution or some normal uh, normal distribution and all of these stuff um so i feel like having the, you know, like the tool set of some of the libraries i would definitely go with the libraries and if not then definitely because uh i mean if i have the understanding of the mathematics behind it then i would 
think uh, twice about uh, implementing from the scratch. No, thanks, that makes sense. Um, so I'm curious kind of what other, uh, was there anything else uh, that you wanted to, to share with us uh, before we open it to last questions and then uh, do mm -hmm. kind of closing? Ah, go ahead. Sure, uh, so this is one of the last slide and here I would like to highlight, uh, again, I was mentioning about that, that's a bi-plot. Um, and so again, I used the PCA, which is principal component analysis. And again, there were like two components. So here I found the interesting covariance of the features, which is the pitch and the pronoun rate, as you can see in this example. And the alignment of these features to the you know, like speaker reported demographic labels for the region, uh, gender, age, and education. Age and education are other certain parameters definitely are not included in the slide. And these are other. Um, I mean, like the variables that we are working on. Um, contrary, I mean, on the some of the you know like anecdotal reports about the da Deborah Bannons and some other social linguistic that they mentioned that these labels have the poor separation across features, and uh, you know like Americans speak just as fast in New York as in the South, for example. So this particular bipolar basically mentions you know like some of the population pairs are definitely linearly separable across these uh, PC dimensions. Um, but there is no such pair of single labels that can be linearly separable. So, um, of course, like this is a 2D plot. I plotted like some 3D and I can't uh, embed in the slides. So I not included over here. Um, in those 3D, 3D plots, I just wouldn't be able to find any pair of the single labels which can be linearly separable. And on the basis of that, it suggests that a non-representative sampling from the demographic group for example, the males uh, from the New York, can, they can also establish an unfounded stereotype of the conversational styles of a larger group themselves, like all the New Yorkers. And here, definitely the arrows, uh, which is the variables and the features, they, which um, point in the same direction and implies that it has high correlation um, between the variables. Uh, whereas the arrows in the opposite direction, they indicate the contrast between the variables that they represent like the speech rate is opposite in contrast to the pitch and pronoun rate. That's uh, pretty much about uh, the yeah, theory behind uh, understanding the concepts of the uh, conversation styles and of course implementing the AB. And I would like to thank uh, the organizers and of course the bunch of the people who are love the audience and they are asking me like, really interesting questions and which is helping me to broaden my horizon of thinking. So really appreciate the